The Vagina Whisperer is on the podcast. First of all, I've stalked you for so long. I used to read the Daily Mail all the time and up pops meet the Vagina Whisperer. And you're sitting at your desk and in the back is all these vaginas sculpted behind you. And I immediately was intrigued. So why are you called the Vagina Whisperer? That's a long story. So the way I started uh, is that I was helping people, victims of female genital mutilation. And I was in Haiti after the earthquake, not for that reason, oh, wow. just for nonprofit work. And there were a lot of patients that we saw, we delivered babies, we did different things. But uh, there was one episode that we have this patient who everybody says she's completely outcast from society and nobody can figure out what's wrong with her. Her husband divorced her. She lives on the street. Why? Because she smells like shit. That's what they said. She smells like poop when she walks around. And the lady has four kids. So I'm like, just bring her in. They're like, are you sure? She really smelled very bad and foul. And because she was outcast from society, nobody, re she didn't really take care of herself either. She slept on the garbage on the side of the street and everything. So she came to the clinic. As soon as I examined her and everybody else left the room, as soon as I examined her, I'm like, there is a fistula in her vagina. Now this is without having a sonogram or anything. Meaning that with her last vaginal birth, she actually, there was a trauma that poked a hole between her vagina and her rectum. So the poop would come from rectum inside her vagina, you know, the fecal matter, and would sit in the vagina and would even get more foul smelling. And for that reason, so uh, I'm like, set her up for surgery. They're like, are you serious? I'm like, yes, we're going to fix her. She's not going to smell anymore. When they told her, she's like, that's not possible in French, you know, and possible. I'm like, possible. So what we did, uh, we opened it up, we found the whole fistula and we closed it. And you don't believe that. After like a couple of days, she was kissing my hand. She, she was crying the whole time and I'm still in touch with her. So that changed her whole life. But that day when I diagnosed that and we fixed her, one of the nurses who was volunteering actually from Arizona with us, she's like, you know what? You're a vagina whisperer. And that name is stuck with me. So you also, though, you make over vaginas, right? How did that start? Like, did you get into it when you were very young? Did you go? Did you did you come out of the womb telling your parents that you were going to make over vaginas? Or is this something that like to give us the trajectory? Yeah, of I that think we got to go. We got to go way <laughs> back with you. What was your where was your childhood? Like, where were, where were you born? And, and how, how was your upbringing? So I was born in Iran and okay. uh, my father is an orthopedic surgeon. If we lived in a hospital, this is uh, in the wartime uh, between Iran and Iraq. We lived in a hospital, like literally 10 kilometers from the lines of war. So wow. in South of Iran. And I remember casualties would come with a dump truck. They would just dump them in front of the hospital. And my dad taught me, the first thing he taught me is how to check people's pulses and see who's alive, who's not alive. Wow. And how old were you when you were seeing this? Five, six. Wow. Okay. So you're at, over the years, like you've seen it all. I didn't know anything else other than practicing medicine. By the age of 12, I was in the operating room assisting my dad. I went to medical school when I was 14 and a half, 15. I finished medical school when I was 21, 22. And I went directly to England. I got a scholarship for sports medicine. So as most people go and they study and eventually they go and work in a hospital or an OR, you basically came up doing this your whole life. I did. I did. And the reason vaginas, I mean, I, I love orthopedic surgery. I uh, actually worked in England uh, back then, did some sports medicine and everything. And with my father, we did a lot of ortho. But back in Iran, I mean, people were very close-minded and you had to be a virgin when you get married. So that's where everything is started. Imagine I'm like 17, 18 years old, third year medical student. And uh, my friends come to me and they're like, oh, you know what? My girlfriend, well, of course we had sex and she's not a virgin anymore. Now she's getting married and she needs to be a virgin. So they needed a hymenoplasty. So since I was like 17, 18, I used to do hymenoplasties to fix oh, wow. people's hymen and make them, you know, a certified virgin, because if they don't bleed that night, you know, they can get into a lot of trouble. 
I mean, it's not like that anymore. Sure. Can you make me a version after pushing out a nine pound baby? Of course, why not? Okay. I mean, I, I've done that. You know, we still get a lot of patients. I don't want to name any cultures, but people who are very traditional. And I have them in Brooklyn and they say, well, you know what? I'm getting married to somebody from back home, you know? And this guy doesn't understand that I lived in America for the past 30 years and I've been having sex. So I need to be a virgin. And I actually had a kid. So I'm like, listen, we can't just put the hymen together because then he's going to have sex with you. Yes, he's going to see the bleeding, but it's going to feel like Holland Tunnel in there. So you have to first tighten the vagina, bring the muscles together. So a vaginoplasty, make it really tight and then uh, make a hymen so she's going to be a virgin again. And wow. Yeah. So, so do you remember your first experience of making over a vagina? And was that an aha moment that you decided that you really wanted to focus on that? Or was it a slow build? It was a slow build because initially, of course, I'm just a medical student. I'm good with my hands. I do surgeries. I do a lot of like, I was stitching people up since I was 12. So, um, but my dad is not a gynecologist. He's a, he's an orthopedic surgeon. So the first time my friends asked me, can you do this? I found a gynecologist who is a friend of my father and he was kind of like my uncle. The guy passed away, but he kind of, you know, he was coming to our house every Friday night. So I told him, I'm like, listen, a friend of mine has this problem. He's like, well, why don't you come and help me assist me in surgery? So I went and I assisted him a few times until I kind of learned it. And of course, just like driving, the more you do, the better you get. So I probably back in Iran in medical school, I did over like 200 hymenoplasties, if not more. Whoa. Is it, I always <laughs> wonder, and we, we got this question too from the audience, is it weird that you're, that you're married? Do you, how do you dissociate between sex and the vagina? Like, like working on the vagina. Do you know what I mean? Of course. Listen. How do you keep it sexy? You know, any gynecologist you ask, uh, it just becomes, it's your job. It becomes so normal. You know, I, I love I love eating and I always ask my chef friends, I'm like, oh my God, if I was you, if I were you, I would be eating everything in the kitchen. And like, you know what? By the time I leave the kitchen, I don't even want to eat anything. because it, It's your job. It, you don't even think about it in a sexual way, but I feel like, uh, you know, I have that kind of appreciation because I have that artsy side. And I kind of know the anatomy and physiology. So I want to bring everything together. I get very rewarded when, let's say, somebody's husband texts me at like 3 in the morning because all my patients have my cell phone number. Text me like 3 a.m. and be like, Dr. Marashi, thank you so much for what you've done. We haven't had sex like this forever. So that's what makes me happy and gives me kind of, you know, gratification. But mm, I mean... My life at home is completely different than my job. So, If you could tell us across the board, what are the reasons that people come to you? Is it primarily aesthetic? Is it how it feels? Is it after a baby? Like, What are all the different reasons? And maybe you could also educate the audience and, and myself and Michael on some things that we're not thinking about. So, you know what? There are different reasons, of course, as you said, and you named a lot of them. Sometimes it's just people purely aesthetically want things to look different. That's mostly for labioplasties. And, you know, the trends are very different than what they were probably 50 years ago, even 30 years ago. People used to have a lot of bush around there, so you wouldn't even see the labias. You know, now you see them. It slowly it become, it became landing a strip and then, you know, everything is gone and now everybody's lasered. So you see that. And then, you didn't have that much access to porn. So people see things and women are more open with their sexuality. For that reason, of course, you get uh, more demands that, you know, aesthetically, I want this to have like a Barbie look. I want things to be more tucked in. Um, and I always tell patients, I'm like, listen, your labias are completely fine and normal for most of patients. It's just, um, it's like your nose, you know, if you feel like your nose is too big, is not something you need to make it smaller. But if you want it, that's a different story. Do you ever get people that want to make it bigger? You know what? Sometimes I, unfortunately, um, 
50% of labioplasties that I do are revision labioplasties. So Meaning some, like somebody's worked on it and you need to come fix it. Exactly. Oh, wow. So imagine on the nose, if somebody took too much of the nose and then there's nothing you know, existing there, you have to kind of build it again. So same thing happens. A lot of people, when they do labioplasties, because there isn't too much training on it, uh, I call it labial amputation. They like literally cut the whole thing because they pull it as they are measuring, you know, they kind of pull it out and they cut it and guess what's going to happen? Everything is going to retract and go back. So when they stitch it, the patient wakes up and says, there's nothing left. So I, I do probably 50% of my labioplasties are that. And yes, I have to make it bigger. I've realized I've said like, wow, I've, I've said wow maybe eight times on the show because I'm so at a loss for words. I'm, I'm a little out of my depths in this one. So I'm not, I'm navigating all this, but you know, pulling the labia and all this stuff. I'm, just apo- <laughs> I'm apologizing to the audience because I've said wow like eight times already. And we're already like, what are we, 10 minutes into the episode? Wow. Well, what, what are, <laughs> if someone comes to you and they're like, I want to tighten my vagina. I want to, I want to, you said what you said, you want to make it like a Barbie, like everything. Does it really hurt? Because that seems like it would really hurt afterwards. You know what, first of all, during the surgery, of course, it doesn't hurt because right. we do it under anesthesia. I prefer to do it under anesthesia and uh, pretty light anesthesia, so you don't have any pain. And a lot of people, if you ask them, they tell you the procedure was very painful. But fortunately, my procedures, or I, I'm training a lot of doctors on the technique that we are using, are not really painful and people don't have that much pain. I tell you the reason. Um, because I try to be more gentle with the tissue. What my father always taught me, and doesn't matter what kind of surgery you do, if you respect the tissue, the tissue is gonna respect you back. Meaning so, as you're doing surgery, you're not you're you're being gentle with the actual tissue of the skin as you're doing the procedure, you're not exactly you're not pulling it, you're not cutting too much, you are not using any instrument to cut it, you only cut the places that you have to cut. And the closing it too, you don't put everything under too much tension. You know, there are a lot of great surgeons out there. But, uh, you know, when I teach people and I I do, I had actually the first, I have the first rotation for cosmetic gynecology that I get OBGYNs and plastic surgeons to come to me to kind of learn this. And when I teach them, I basically tell them, look, imagine this is your own penis or your own vagina. You know, you have to be super gentle as you're doing it. The energy that you're using to cut it needs to be the least invasive energy. And any kind of bleeding that you see, you have to stop it immediately. You don't want the patient to come at three in the morning. And I get a lot of those people that are coming from somebody else with a swollen watermelon in the middle of their legs, you know. Oh my God. Holy shit. So I feel like you're a hundred percent right about the tissue comment. Cause I've had surgery before and, and sometimes you'll wake up with a really sore neck because they move you around and d- they sort of like treat you like you're like a dummy. You know what I'm saying? So that makes a lot of sense. A lot of people who are surgeons have a certain style. So like, I know there's like a nose doctor that has a certain style. Do you have a certain style vagina that you go towards? Like that you're known for? Is it a certain look? Uh, you know what? First of all, for inside of the vagina, of course, and we're going to talk about it, but inside nobody really sees it. Uh, but for inside, I have a very certain style because I want it to be exactly like the anatomy that you had before. Okay. What's the style? Explain it. Get really specific. Sure. <laughs> he has to take a sip of water. So do I. Michael's hyperventilating. I, I, I take a sip of water too. <laughs> so look, If you look at the vagina from front, imagine the patient is laying down in front of me. The legs are open and, oh, perfect. We have a vagina here. So we have the vagina right here, the opening. As you are going in the vagina, the angle, the normal angle needs to be downwards, needs to be like this. Why is it going down like this? The reason is that anatomically, we have the angle downward. So when you have intercourse, the penis goes in, and most penises are a little bit upwards tilted. As it goes in, it stimulates the front wall of the vagina. So this is the vagina, it's going down, the penis goes up, 
it stimulates the front because this is the most important wall of the vagina because the clitoris is sitting on top, all the G zone and G spot and everything is sitting up front. So even if the guy doesn't know what's going on and his penis is like two centimeters and like very small, if you have the angle right and he knows where to stimulate. You, you know, hear that guys? You hear that? It's all about the angle. It's not the size. They say size matters. Size, size is good. You know, it matters because it, as a man, it gives me self-confidence, sure. which is great, but uh, really is the angle. And we just uh, actually, we are coming out with another research, but you know, I have um, me and uh, one of my partners, I have a, a director of artificial intelligence and uh, ultrasound. And what she did with me is that we came up with the first ultrasound protocol for clitoris. So we actually do a sonogram on clitoris and we measure clitoral length, clitoral engorgement, and the length of clitoris as it gets erected, which is almost the size of a penis. So because there are parts of clitoris that are in and nobody knows about that. We dissected a lot of you know, clitorises. We actually found how the clitoris looks inside because of the surgeries that I do on a woman with like female genital mutilation, I know the anatomy of clitoris really well. So we did this with ultrasound and nobody cares about clitoris. If you ask any medical student, they don't teach them about clitoris in medical school. They think it's like, there's a little dot dot here and that's it. But in reality, clitoris goes in, goes on both sides, and goes again on both sides. So it's pretty big. And when it gets engorged, it's the entire anterior wall of the vagina. So when you go on that angle, you really stimulate it. The patient, I mean, the patient, the person is going to really, really, really come. You should create merch that says, get the angle or die. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay, okay, the angle needs to be right. That's very important. So the angle. Look, I didn't the, realize you need to get like a protractor out. No, I got to do my yeah, measurements. You, I got to get all the, I got to. Yeah. You're going to be all refreshed. I cannot have sex for another two weeks. So it's, you'll, you'll, you'll get a full course <laughs> in exactly what position to do. You know that, do. that meme that's going in all those numbers and things and <laughs> angles are going around the guy's head? That's going to be me. I'm going to be calculating the angles. <laughs> What's a case that you can remember where someone came in and maybe they had like a huge baby or they had like 10 babies or something so crazy and you just revamped them and made them feel great. So I actually have a friend uh, who's a friend and also a patient of mine who is, um, where is she from? She, she's, um, she's from the uh, old Soviet Union. I don't want to name any country's name, but Anyways, she's one of my really good friends in Brooklyn and she had four vaginal deliveries. And she's like, you know what? There's no, we always had this joke during parties and everything. Whenever people talked about sex, she's like, well, you know, I only give him blowjobs because there's no hope for my vagina. I'm like, why are you saying that? And she's like, listen, you don't know what went on there. The first two kids I had, I had it at back home and like literally as I was being delivered, kind of the doors were closed. They don't let the family come in and all of those. And I was in labor for two days and I had a tear and I had bleeding and it was so bad. Apparently it's like, you, she's like, you don't even want to look at my vagina. I'm like, come to the office. Let's take a look at it. And she's like, absolutely not. We went back and forth. And when she finally accepted to come in and I examined her, it was really bad. It was probably one of the worst cases I've seen because... Why? It was just stretched out? Like, what do you mean? What is really it, bad mean? It sounds like they did it. It was like they didn't give her good postpartum care and there's tears and... Exactly. Yeah. So they didn't give a good postpartum care to the tears. So she got infected afterward Ugh. and she had a huge scar. And of course, the stretching, listen, everybody stretches, but the muscle was torn in multiple places. Uh, and believe it or not... Uh, she actually, she got a divorce from her husband. So he probably hates me right now. And he, if he listens to this, because he thinks that I'm, uh, you know, the cause of their divorce, because he's like, you know what? After you did this, like a couple of years into it, she became a whore. That's what he says. So, <laughs> oh shit. I didn't know that was where you were going to go with it, but all right. <laughs> she was ready to show her new vagina off. It, 
the vagina, like if you looked at it, both from outside and inside, she was telling me, she's like, I want to just show off my vagina. I want the lights to be on. I want to sit on people's faces. And she's very vocal. And she's like, look, this looks like when I was 18. It hasn't been like this for the past 25 years or 20 but years. Did the or husband, not, did he not appreciate that? Or she just wanted to show everyone. She wanted to show everyone her new puss. She wanted to pop puss. You know what? Actually, Lauren, I don't know if we want to go much farther with this episode. Yeah, <laughs> I I think that this sounds so interesting. I've had two babies. So what if I come in and I'm like, I want you to revamp my vagina? Like, what do you tell someone that's my age? Do you do all different kinds of ages? I, I do all different kinds of ages. And look, uh, every person is different and anatomies are, of course, different. So depending on what's going on, let's say talking about the vagina since we are because then we can get back to labias. So vagina is the part that's inside, correct? And that's the part that penis enters it. So you want to make sure, I mean, in my mind, you want to make sure that the angle is good. Because first of all, it's not, oh, it looks cute. It doesn't look cute. You want to make sure it's functional. You know, it's like... And it's not just functional for the penis. It's functional so the woman can have an orgasm, correct? Exactly. Yeah. Can, so imagine, God forbid, if... Uh, you get a problem and one of your eyes go blind. They can take it out and they can basically put a fake eye that looks exactly like your eye. And it's going to look very cute, but does it, is it going to have a function? It's not. So uh, same thing with the vagina. You can make it look cute, you know, like back in the days uh, when people wanted to get married. In Iran, we have this saying, they would actually put the makeup around this woman who let's say, had a husband before and got divorced or the husband died, I mean, probably the husband died, they would do makeup around their vagina so it looks better. So we have this saying, it says, you know, that makeup is going to make the vagina look cuter, but uh, it's not going to make it tighter. Uh, you really have to work on the angle. That's the first thing. And of course, depending on how distorted the angle and the anatomy is, there are a few different things you can do. The most modest one is, of course, laser vaginal rejuvenation. You've probably heard about it. What laser does, it enters the vagina. It starts shooting all the walls of the vagina. And it's kind of like when you do microneedling on your face. So you're kind of doing microneedling all over your vagina. What's going to happen? When you do microneedling, your face starts rebuilding collagen and elastin, and the skin becomes a little tighter. Same thing happens inside the vagina when you do the laser. Is it going to do anything to the muscle? Absolutely not. It's going to make it slightly tighter. So that's the good thing about laser. It's good for people to get a little bit of makeover. Let's say if you get um, a deep fraxel on your face. Yeah, it sounds like a deep facial. I'm the type of person, like, if I'm going to do something, like, let's do it. I, the laser sounds kind of like, uh, like blase. So next step after that, and exactly. So you, you are the facelift kind of person. You're like, if I want to do it, let's do a facelift. So everything. Yeah. Like instead of like doing like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an intense person. I would Perfect. say. <laughs> no, I, I mean, uh, I, I completely agree with you. If you want to do it, you want to really enjoy it. So I'm not going to tell you about the next step after laser. We're going to come back to that. So the most drastic one that really fixes everything is a full on vaginoplasty. And in vaginoplasty, what you do, you like literally bring the muscles back together, bring the vaginal mucosa together. You like literally tighten everything uh, from inside in the part that matters. And that is very important. So vagina is a long canal. What happens, a lot of doctors who don't have experience and they start doing this. And unfortunately, it's gotten more and more because there is so much more demand for it. You know, cosmetic gynecology grew by a thousand percent in the past two years, just in labioplasties and vaginoplasties. So, oh, you know what is a cash procedure? Let me do it too, because I used to deliver babies and I know how to stitch people up and I haven't done any, but the patient comes to me, they're like, oh, do you do it? Sure. So after you give or during your birth, you will actually come in and stitch the person up? Not during the birth. We're going to do it after, but I'm telling you a but lot. Like of, right after, right? In the, like you, you're the doctor that would stitch them up. Uh, I, I don't deal with deliveries anymore. Got the it. last baby I delivered actually uh, was six years ago. And I completely stopped that because I'm focusing more on 
endometriosis and cosmetic vaginal surgery. But uh, what happens is that some people think they need to tighten the vagina all the way down to the cervix. And that is wrong because that's what messes up the angle and the anatomy of the vagina. And patients come back, they're like, oh, I'm dry. I don't feel well. I don't get the orgasms. And then you see that the doctor thought they did a very good job because they went all the way down and they actually, it took them longer too, but they overdid it. So you really want to do it in the part that you have to do it, which is really the first like four or five centimeters of the vagina. It's like the penis, you know? What's the most sensitive part of the penis? Is really the glands of the penis, you know? You can hold the bottom part of the penis and do whatever with it. It gets stimulated, but is not like the tip of the penis. So same thing with the vagina. You want to work around the area that affects the clitoris and the G zone. You mentioned better orgasms. So are you actually doing something in surgery that's giving people better orgasms or are yes. you teaching It sounds like them? fixing the angle is a big part of it, right? Exactly. You got to get that projector out. <laughs> yeah, well, I've been or paying protractor. Attention. Well, it sounds like if your <laughs> angle's <laughs> off and you're missing the angle, then you're, you're putting yourself at the deficit here. Don't fuck here. the angle up. Because if the angle is right, as you said, it's just, you can be blind. You can just put a finger in there and it's going to reach uh, the, the right G place. zone and the clitoris. So the right place. So you really want to correct the angle. Now, there is a procedure in between these two because I saw some patients don't want to go all the way with a full-on vaginoplasty and be like six weeks, they can't have sex, they can't do anything and they don't really want to settle for a laser vaginal rejuvenation. So three years ago, I established something. I mean, I did it so many times on patients. I call it kind of a minimally invasive vaginoplasty. It's trademarked as Vagilangelo. And I've trained a lot of doctors on it. So in the Vagilangelo procedure, what we do, we do two things. I don't try to fix the whole thing. I just, with like three special stitches, I fix the angle of the vagina. And at the same time, I inject the G spot with the patient's own PRP, which oh. we're going to talk about that. So you do both of those. The, it's so smart. The good thing about that. Why are you whispering that? <laughs> because it's really smart. I mean, I, th that's essentially what I think works the best on the face is injecting your own blood. So that would make sense if you inject it in your G spot that it's like it's good for the nerve endings, right? Hundred percent. Yeah, and for the blood supply uh -huh. and for the lubrication. So you you can even just do. I mean, we inject PRP. I, I love PRP. I put it anywhere, even on myself. It's great. So uh, and we can put it in penis too, which I do. So if if I need help, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you need help. So you so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna get the whole shebang and then you can get PRP injected in your dick. Can he be awake though? I don't want him to be asleep. He needs to be awake. He's he's not gonna feel it because you put some ice on it. The problem with men Just put me out, put me out. I no no no. Listen, the problem with men is that they see the needle. I mean, I'm the same. I can cut I can cut people all day, but if they wanna take my blood, I'm gonna start screaming. I know, so. That's so interesting. Like, that is so crazy to me that you yeah. do what you do and you're scared to get I, your blood taken. I don't like it. Well, you know what's funny too is like Lauren's had medical procedures. She talked about she had boob jobs stuff like that, and she is she cannot take her like she during even during birth she like will not give her blood. She doesn't want anyone to do any kind of IVs or anything. It sounds like, but she's not squeamish when she has to get a surgery at all. With beauty, if it's beauty. If it's a, a filler or Botox, But you guys, like, taking fine. blood is so much Ugh. easier than what you guys it's are invasive. both talking about. It's invasive. It's <laughs> invasive. Yeah. Wait, so 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 you can inject PRP to make an orgasm better at the same time that you're doing vaginoplasty? Of course, we can do that. And with Vagilangelo is that the reason we came up with that procedure is that there's no downtime for it. So there's no, it's not really surgery. You do it in the office. It takes 10, 15 minutes. I have a lot of doctors right now all over the US who came and got trained with me and patients really love it because instead of going through the whole vaginoplasty, they go in, in the office, they basically make a cut, they put some stitches in the places they need to do, they correct the angle, they inject the G-spot and the patient is done. No sex for two weeks. And after that, when, when they start having sex, they are at least 50% better. Now, if you did the full on vaginoplasty, and I mean, G-spot injection at the same time, you would be 100% better, but 
remember, you're going to have the downtime and the price is going to be a lot higher. So. What is the price and what's the recovery like? Let, let's say you want to do the whole shebang. I mean, the whole, sh- there are lots of things in the shebang, like which one, just inside. Maybe um, if a regular vaginoplasty with the injection of the G-spot. How much is that? So injection of G-spot, usually, I mean, across US, people charge anything between 1000 to 1500 just to inject PRP. Okay, that's that's about what I would think the PRP right. would be. So what if you're going to do the whole surgery, though? So for vaginoplasty, depending on the where you get it done, of what city, because the cost of surgery is a lot of it goes to anesthesia and the surgical facility and all of those stuff, which I don't like to deal with those. Considering all of those for vaginoplasty, you pay something between eighty five hundred to like ten thousand. And that's is that the like the best special that like is that the biggest the big shebang? So no, that's just the vaginoplasty. If Got you it. want to get the labias nicer too, that's of course that's completely separate. That's almost like the same price, sometimes higher. What's the most expensive vagina that you've ever done? Around fifty thousand. That's about what I would think. Whoever's out there with the $50,000 vagina, I would love to interview you. Just saying, if you want to drop into my Instagram. <laughs> I tell you the problem with Instagram and the problem with, uh, no, I actually, I was lying. I, I, in in Dubai, I, I charge more too. Uh, in Dubai, it's so funny. I once did surgery. I did a vaginoplasty on a patient who I didn't know she's important. Uh, I mean, her husband, I guess, was important. But after I did the surgery on her, I like literally... Three other women were brought by the husband of the same woman. They were all his wives. So one wife got the surgery and they are like, you bitch got the surgery and our vagina needs to be tighter than hers. So they all came <laughs> to me and and each of them before surgery, like, oh, make sure mine is the tightest. I'm like, okay, sure. So <laughs> is there a certain tightness that you could, you make them all the same when you do it? Or is it is some tighter than others? How do you justify what you're doing there? No, reality is that vagina is uh, stretchable and flexible. So it's like a muscle. So you tighten it to the amount that you need to tighten. I usually go by the two of my fingers. I need to fit in it like not comfortably, a little snug. And what happens is that depending on the partner, it's going to stretch, but it's going to stretch to the size of partner's penis, not to the size of like a baby's head that could go through it. So that's usually my rule. Um, the partners that are more open with it, I want to take a look at their penis and kind of make sure that we are not you going a consultation to... right now. Show right? your <laughs> dick. Show your dick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the fluff camera... it up. Fluff it up. <laughs> let me let me, let me, yeah, let me let me fluff it up. <laughs> <laughs> What's that'll the, look good on you. This will, that'll look good on YouTube, right? I would, for by the way, when I do this, I'm putting it out into the ether. You are gonna have to show your penis so we can see exact measurements because wouldn't be the first time someone else saw it. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know. uh, what is your recovery period if you do vaginal plasty? Like, for, as you said, you mentioned six weeks. Are you laying down? Are you in bed? Can you walk around? Can you exercise? Give us the whole idea around that. And no, you as you as we talked about it, I, I try to be very respectful to the tissue. So you are gonna be walking immediately after the surgery. And most of the patients who, especially in New York, we have a lot of international and like national patients who fly to us, they get there the day before, and uh, we operate on them in the morning, uh, and they leave like next day. So you can get on the plane next day. You can do anything you want to do except for no sex for six weeks, not going in the jacuzzi or bathtub or anything that the water goes up in the vagina. No tampons, no douching, none of those for six weeks. Other than that, you can do anything else you want to do. So it's similar like after giving birth protocol. Right. But you know what? You are way more mobile after this because after birth, yeah, yeah, yeah. the thing is that you've gone through the whole childbirth and the head was sitting in the vagina for a while. It, uh, everything is sore. This is very goal oriented. We know exactly where the incision is. So the patient is completely Nothing's com- coming out. Yeah. Nothing coming out. Do you feel like you've had mostly positive experiences afterwards? Do you feel like everyone is like super happy afterwards? Or does anyone come back and they're like, I regret it? You know what? I have a lot of patients who come 
And I don't want to say, oh my God, I'm the best, but I have a lot of pay. I, no, I, you are. You're the authority on no, it. No, no, I, we no. looked into it. Yes, you are. I, I've just done I'll more. I, I, thank you so You're much. You're the vagina whisperer. You don't get that. You know, we've talked about you on this show for years. And I'm like, how does one get that title? Yeah. Obviously, you just answered it, but I don't think you, I don't get. You don't, I don't think you're to keep that title if you're not, you know, so there's top of not the a lot of people that have come back and said, eh. No, I, I, uh, I never, I mean, uh, knock on wood, I never had that kind of experience. But reality is that it's just like driving or anything else, you know, probably the first like 10, 15, 20 anybody does, they are not as good as when they do like hundreds and thousands of them and they start teaching it. So I feel like at this point, uh, I don't really get any negative comments. Probably long time ago, I would have a couple of times that I needed to go correct something. Like 10 years ago, eight years ago, I had to go correct something. But, uh, you know, when you focus, and that's one reason I gave up delivering babies because in medicine, there was a time that you were like a gynecologist and you would do everything with, with women. You need to be focused on one thing. You have to have a niche. You have to get good at it. And if somebody comes to me right now and they say, you know what, I have a cervical cancer or I have an abnormal pap smear, I send them to the right person. Even if it's my wife, I'm going to send them to somebody who deals with 40 of those a day. That is so Right. What you're saying, because the the most successful doctors we've had on this podcast, like a a great one is Dr. Jason Diamond. And he is so focused on his niche with the face and he's so damn good at it. And you're so right. When you focus in on that niche, your niche, you just become better and better and better and better at it. I personally would want to go to someone that has the specialty. I have to ask this question for in your field of work. People are wondering this, like, what are the potential complications if someone maybe doesn't go to the right person or they don't think about the right procedure? Like, what are the, what are some of the things you've seen gone south, especially because you say 50% of these you have to correct? You know, I have to, I mean, I can't show it to you, but I have to show you the amount of direct messages that I get every single day, not from US, from everywhere. I Yesterday, I got like two from Philippines. I got one from Korea. I got a couple from Iran even that, uh, you know, a lot of swelling, infections, uh, getting sizes wrong. One side is looks like something; the other side looks, the, you know, completely asymmetrical. So these are things that can happen. And unfortunately, a year after surgeries, when people start having sex more and more, a lot of I see a lot of cases with loss of sensation, which oh, is that's n- a bummer. Which is not good especially with labioplasties. You know, labia has a lot of sensation, especially when you go close to clitoris. So this is the clitoral hood and this is the clitoris underneath. So if you get too much into clitoral hood and you don't know your anatomy, you can fuck up the sensation. It just, it, and it's not good. Um, and I, I tell, like, you know, I, I don't know anybody else and we're trying to correct that. I actually started a program to train doctors we are trying to teach people to do ultrasound studies on the area before touching the labia. And for anybody who is listening to this, I mean, if, you, if your doctor is just taking a couple of pictures and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do it, and they don't even explain it to you how they are going to do it, tell them, are you going to do an ultrasound before it? And if they say no or they laugh at you, don't even go to them because you really want to see. And listen, I, I, I didn't do ultrasounds before. And I learned the anatomy a lot and I dissected it. But now I see how much more information it gives you. It's kind of like, you know, going in somewhere and you know what's happening before going in, you know, but the the orthopedic surgeon, they want to do a surgery on a broken bone. They do multiple x-rays, CT scan. They know exactly what they're getting themselves into. Why shouldn't we do this for you when you were pregnant? They did so many ultrasound sonograms to see what's happening with the baby. They want to make sure they know everything. Why isn't clitoris as important? And I tell you why. This is the problem with clitoris. You know, we did a lot of stuff for male orgasm. Um, Of course, men were a lot more important during history, even uh, many, many years. And if you go back, the first version of Gray's Anatomy had clitoral anatomy in it, the full clitoral anatomy. 
And guess what? Freud came early 1900, and he called clitoral orgasms immature orgasms. So he's like, you know what? Any orgasm that's clitoral is immature orgasm, and only mature orgasms are the orgasms that happen inside the vagina. And guess what happened? Gray's Anatomy and all different books dropped clitoral anatomy completely. So if anybody who's gone to medical school the past 50, 100 years, they have never dissected, I mean, they may have dissected the clitoris if they liked it on the, you know, on uh, the cadaver, but they did not really have it in their books. The correct clitoral anatomy doesn't exist. The nerve endings don't exist. As an OBGYN, nobody taught me. You know, you have to go learn this yourself. And there's a problem now. They started doing it because a, a lot of people had, uh, you know, voiced their concerns, people who lost sensation after uh, these surgeries. They started talking about it. And we started talking about it. doctors need to learn. They need to know what's happening underneath. There is not just a piece of meat that you want to cut through it. You know, do you cut somebody's penis without knowing what, I mean. <laughs> Speaking of penis. Well, it's so, it's, it's so scary that you, I mean, in a lot of ways, and I think this can, you know, this is probably happens in other fields of medicine too, is like people don't forget that we're, st there's still so much that we don't know about the human body, not even just in this, but just in the, the human body in general. And obviously doctors and experts are constantly searching for answers, but think of all the things we've discovered just in the last 25, 30 years, right? So it totally makes sense what you're saying. Now you're completely right. And you know, the problem with this area is that a lot of areas you talk about it, but this is an area that there is so much taboo around it. Yep. You know, they call this area, they call it the pudendal area. You know what that means? Mm -mm. In Latin, it means the area to be ashamed of. Wow. So this is pudendal area, the area to be ashamed of. And this is the biggest problem. You don't talk about it. There is too much taboo around it. The reason I did that, and thank God I did it so people like you saw me and knew the story and we talked about it. The reason I did the first designer vagina fashion show in New York City was not to line up people with like nice vaginas. And that's not what we did. We actually talked about the taboo that's going on. And we started taking away the stigma around all these procedures and around owning your, you know, vagina labia and wanting it to look nicer, have better functionality. You know, for years, my grandmother, she had problems with urination. I know a lot of my friends, they're like six, eight, 10 kids, lots of problems with urination, lose urine, do this, do that. I ask them like, do you have any problems with urination? You have like 10 kids? No. I'm like, come on, I'm a gynecologist, right? Then you can talk to me. Well, yes, but you can't do anything about it. It's normal. That's what she told me. She's like, then you have kids, that's just normal. I'm like, it's not normal. Took her to the hospital, fixed it up, fixed the angle of the bladder. And guess what? She's like, I can't believe that for 40 years I was, I was wearing a diaper. And this is the problem. Women don't talk about it. It's kind of like endometriosis, the other thing that I love. If you have pain with your periods, everybody says, well, it's normal. Cramps with period is normal. It's part of being a woman. You know, it, it's not. And you have to get to the root of it. And the same thing happens with the vaginas. You know, if there is a problem that happened and you can fix it, why should you think that because I'm a woman, I have to just cover this and, you know, if my husband wants to go start cheating on me because he doesn't enjoy what's happening here anymore, let him do it because that's the nature of the man. And the nature of the woman is that after 40 years, they shouldn't have sex and they should be like menopausal and I should just be home and cooking clean. This is what. Do you see a lot of women who come in that are like, my husband's cheating on me. I want to get this vagina revamped to get him back. Does that ever work? Well, a lot of them, I tell them and they tell me, I'm like, do it for yourself. Don't do it for him. 100%. Do it for yourself. Same with the boob job. Listen, the lady I told you about, my good friend, and I'm going to tell her, she, she's going to listen to this later, that her husband thinks now she's a whore because of the surgery I did on her. It's actually not a whore. She, her boyfriend, who is going to get married to her very soon, 
it's I think the guy is worth over two billion dollars. So it's actually I think that's why the her husband vagina is, is worth two billion dollars. You guys, she got her <laughs> vagina and it's worth a two billion. Talk about it appreciating. Oh my asset. god. <laughs> <laughs> she's gonna hear this she's gonna, i mean she definitely upgraded uh in that sense but it's it's not really because of that you do it for yourself and you know it's very different when when you are 17 18 19 20 of course your vagina hasn't gone through anything and you have a great vagina anatomically everything is correct but you don't have the brain to kind of work with the vagina you know, in synchrony. And what happens is that, yeah, you have sex, you don't know what you're doing. The boyfriend doesn't know what they're, oh, it better hurts or doesn't hurt. You just, you don't enjoy it like that. And, you know, your brain doesn't have as much development than when you have your like 35 years, 40 years under your belt. And then, you know, you get your vagina done. Now your vagina is 18 to 20 years old. But you know what you're doing. And your brain is mature. And you're going to make that guy go crazy. Change your name to Dr. Goodtime. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, honestly, like... Well, and you know what's funny? Is make, what I was thinking, this is now I'm going back to the very beginning of the show, but when you're saying that you take people that have like 35, 40 years of experience and you turn them into virgins and they meet a new guy that thinks he's a virgin, I was thinking like, Imagine that guy thinks he's getting a virgin and you got somebody with 35 years of experience and a brand new vagina. He's gonna, that guy's you, not going to know what hit him. If you and I divorce, I'm going to get my vagina redone and I'm going to say tell everyone I'm a virgin and go for a guy with $2 billion. I <laughs> I might do the exact same thing. <laughs> Listen, we're going to make his penis stronger. And yeah. then <laughs> I want to talk about the penis. You said off That's air true. that you can also make the penis stronger. You didn't say longer. You said stronger. What is strong? Like, <laughs> so you're saying like you take like a limp penis and you make it like rock hard. What does that mean? What is stronger? So, you know, a lot of problems that happen with penis is really erectile dysfunction. So, uh, uh, I mean, the penis is there. The blood flow is there because you're alive, but you don't get the erections the way you used to get them. So what you can do for that is really to start rebuilding these vessels that are there, make the nerves more sensitive and all of those. And there are different things that you can do. There's radio frequency, shockwave therapy that's very, you know, effective. PRP is very, very effective. For the penis. For the penis. Does huh. it hurt? Yeah. Uh, you know what? You, you put a little bit of ice on your penis before. Sure, you put fine. a little bit of numbing and you don't look. When you don't look, a lot of my patients, the first time they're scared and they get like a squeamish when they see the needle but the second time when they come they're like don't even tell me when it's going in because you numb the skin and you put the ice and sometimes they're like oh are you done i'm like yeah i'm done let me ask you two because uh, now i can oh, jump. Now, now, now you well, have now questions I, now oh, look at you. I can jump in okay. because i mean okay. i have the equipment i understand it <laughs> um i've heard some people talk about stem cells for the penis what is your what are your thoughts on that? I don't want to go too far on a tangent, but what are your thoughts? No, no, no. It's actually I I do a lot of stem cells too. So I tell you the same thing that I do with PRP, which can be done in the face, in the vagina, or on the penis. You would try PRP first before you jump to stem cells. No, but you can do the same thing with the stem cells too, but it's just more expensive. So let's say in New York, I have a few of my patients that they are like really good friends and they are all basketball wives. And they used to come for PRP injections and they loved it. And once I told one of them, she's like, do you have anything stronger for this? I'm like, well, we can do stem cell, but just for the lab to process it is going to be like a couple of thousand dollars. And sure. this, so I'm like, is it going to be like five, six thousand in to just do it? She's like, you know what? Let's go for it. And after that, all her friends want to get the stem cell too. It's a little bit more, you know, has more details. You have to come we do a little tiny, tiny liposuction. But does it, do you, in your experience, how much, if if it is, much, much more effective are stem cells than PRP? Because I know it's a jump up. No, it, it's probably like almost like 50 to 100% more effective than PRP. And it lasts longer, of course. Yep. Um, second question on vasectomies. Maybe this is not your world of expertise, but does a vasectomy affect performance at all? No. No. And what is that? Is that what's that proce procedure like compared to the others? He's like, oh, uh, well, uh, well, the reason, the reason he's I'm like stuttering because he's getting nervous. It, yeah, tell her, tell him all about the vasectomy because you're gonna definitely get one in your future. Yeah, she's she's teeing me up. Yeah, oh. tell him. Does it hurt? I mean, no, it doesn't. Actually, vasectomy. I've I've done a bunch of them when I was back in Iran because you had to 
in our internship, we uh, used to do some with this nonprofit organization. And it was so easy. We would do it in back of this bus that people would come from one door. And this is like in villages. You go there and these guys who have like more than like six, seven kids, they just come for vasectomies. And you just numb, we used to just numb the skin of testicles, you know, <sighs> your scrotum and make a tiny cut. So you wouldn't even feel it because it's numb already. Tiny cut and you just uh, take the tube that transfers the sperm and you just basically tie it on both sides and cut in between. Uh, if you did it in the back of buses, can you just do it right now on him? No, no, no. Do you have a, do you have a knife? <laughs> no, let me see. Give me the big knife. I have a knife. Oh, yeah, God. <laughs> so how many... We got some time on that. I'm just, I'm, pre I'm prepping myself. How many celebrities and influencers and everyone is doing this, these vagina procedures that we don't know? Is, it, is this happening everywhere and we're just not seeing it? You know what, Lauren? I have a big problem with this. And I tell you right now online, I wish I was doing people's lips or noses because I don't get any recognition on this. I have so many people. <laughs> I, I have singers. I have actresses. They come to me. And this is actually one of the people who paid $50,000 because she wanted the office to be closed in the morning, the surgery center. She came with her entourage, everything, and we did her surgery. And she was super happy when she came back. She wanted me not to block the office for like two hours so nobody else comes in. And I told her, I'm like, listen, let's collaborate together. Let's put a story on Instagram or something. Because I saw she knew, she's like, oh, I loved your last post. I'm like, hold on, you're following me? She's like, no, I can't follow you, silly. Everybody knows that, you know, I follow you if I follow you. Like, what's wrong with following me? So I told her, let's put a story up. And she's like, look, if you were doing my lips or my nose, I would put 10 stories for you because you really deserve it. But I can't tell anybody I did my vagina done. My vagina is perfect already. That is the problem. We have so much shame. That's the pudendal area. And still there is taboo around it that nobody wants to talk about it unless you find somebody who is as open as, let's say, you and you want to talk about it. Most people, this is the area that is still there so closed up. And people with influence, they don't want to talk about what they are getting done. It's I got strange. a boob job at 19 years old. And I remember I told everyone up front that I got it. And at, at 19 years old, it was very, very taboo. And now getting a boob job is like going to get your teeth cleaned. No, no one gives a shit anymore. Hopefully in 10 years, 20 years, it will be the same At way. At the time, the it. whole city was up in arms, the whole neighborhood, all yeah, the whole Everyone school. was like, it couldn't believe I was getting a boob job at 19. And now it's like like a paper cut. It's, Listen, it's Dr. Marashi, if I go there and I get some stem, stem cells in my penis and we turn this thing into 100% stronger, I'll shout it from the rooftops. I'll be out <laughs> you there. Will? I'll be telling everyone I got the strongest penis in the game. I'll be out there screaming it from the rooftops. Yeah. Okay, so I have a I question. Want, I would want everyone to know that. Th this is a selfish question. If someone wants to get a mommy makeover like and they want to do everything and we talked about this off air too and say they want to get their boobs done and a tummy tuck and everything you can also go in and do a procedure on them at the same time is that how it works of course that's that's actually the best time to do it uh so usually uh, with the plastic surgeons that i have the relationship with and we know kind of our style because you know, they need to know me and I need to know their work because it's kind of, uh, you are putting your stamp on this and this is kind of like your product. So you can't, you can't build a nice Mercedes like G-Wagon and be like, oh, you know what? I don't have the steering wheel. I'm going to get the Toyota steering wheel for it, you know? So they need to be up to par with the same kind of surgery that I'm doing. So, and I have to be up to par with their standards. So with those people, Yes, you can do it all at the same time, but do not ever go to somebody like if I told you, oh, I'm going to do your vagina and your breast and your belly at the same time. And bad there idea. are some people who say a bad idea. Okay. If I can do boobs, which I can, and I've done them because, you know, sometimes when I do these surgeries, I go assist the other doctor because I want him to finish faster or I want to help him. And I definitely am a lot better than their assistant, but I would never do the measurements or tell him how much to cut and everything because it's not my area of expertise, right. you know? That makes and sense. he comes and helps me. But the cutting, I have to do for the vagina. And that's the most important thing. And that's what I teach my residents. You only have one chance to cut. So I always say measure twice, cut once. And you have to go to the right person 
to measure it really twice and cut once. And that's why, but it's, it's amazing to do everything at the same time. It would be the best. I always, I, I mean, listen, I, I get that not everybody's in the, in the same financial circumstance, but I always think about these per- boob jobs, tummy, whatever face stuff, vagina stuff. I always think like, if you're going to spend money, like this is the area you don't want to save on. Like this is the area no. you want to go to you the, the best money. you can. Right. Because or else maybe like if you're if you're going to maybe go to someone that's not up to par, like you could have so many other problems by going the cheaper route, maybe. And, you know, the, the problem is that you can't. A lot of people come to me and they had the wrong surgery done, let's say, 10 years ago. And the problem is that they can't even go talk about it because when it's your nose. You can go tell people, you can go start suing people, go to court, do oh. this, do that. Where's the vagina? I mean, you're not going to go sue a doctor over your vagina, uh, which gives the doctor, the doctor knows that vulnerability probably. I mean, there are some people who started doing it and actually they, they want to use me as like expert fitness on these things, but it's, it's still very difficult because you can't go to the court and take down your pants and be like, oh, look at my vagina. It used to be like this. Or you can make any kind of claims and be like, you know what? Oh my God. That's, that's a tough one. Um, before you go, can you leave some tips for our male listeners to pleasure a woman better? (laughs) Like give us some, uh, uh, this is a lot of the audience's questions, like some best sexual positions for a female orgasm. Forget about the guy. No one cares. Like give us some, some tips to just pleasure the girl. Listen, this is a very good question and it came at the right time. Uh, we were just actually published in Sexology magazine, which is uh, the Journal of European Sexual Association, which is amazing. And I'm so proud. I had three publications with them this month only. Wow. And uh, I, I I did it with my colleague, Dr. Lovey, who is, she's amazing too. She works for me. She is a Yale and Harvard grad, uh, a chemical engineer, went to medical school. Like she knows a lot of his stuff and she's a radiologist at the same time. So we came up with the uh, protocol to look at the clitoris with ultrasound. So what we did, we mixed artificial intelligence, ultrasound techniques and biomechanics, which is the mechanics, the physics in human body. We mixed all these three together to see what position is the most rewarding position for women. Top. And... Guess what? Top. After doing, I'm going to tell you, after doing all these forces, and you're going to see, I actually have it on my last post on Instagram. I have a lot of, uh, go to NYC Gyno. I have all of the pictures, how it happens. And we did immediately with that position, we did ultrasound on the clitoris to see how much blood flow and how engorged it gets. And guess what? Man on top, missionary position that is the most vanilla position gets the most engorgement in the clitoris and if you want to get even more engorgement do missionary with the pillow under woman's buttocks because the angle the angle oh my <laughs> he's the angle guy oh ah, my god the angle you whisper. Listen, you make the this- angle <laughs> Listen, you, you make you make some of this about math, and I'm like, I now I can now I can crack the codes every time. Listen, I use this podcast to slightly manipulate my husband. No, it makes sense. This this is the vagina. He's he's very good. This is the vagina. Now put a pillow underneath here, and guess what? The angle is even better. So when he enters, <laughs> he is killing the clitoris, and this clitoris gets so stimulated. <laughs> if you look at those ultrasound results that we have in the paper. It's just the whole thing is red and blue. It's like filled with blood. So let me ask you this, based on these angles. <laughs> I would assume actually in some cases being on top is maybe the worst. What do you mean? Like Me- the woman meaning, on top. Meaning for the angle might be... The woman on top. Yeah. But you know what? The woman on top is not bad because the woman knows where she's most sensitive. So what they do, they move around to rub your they, penis they know how to get the they, so they get in the angle they do it so what, so okay so what is in what would you think in your experience is the worst angle then one of the ones that you actually give the least amount of pleasure to women 
would be doggy style. Uh, would be the knee chest position. A uh, lot of men love it. Yeah, that's a. That's I a, don't that's mind a, doggy style at all because I use a vibrator. If you have a vibrator while you're having sex, it's fine. Like it's fine. That's tough news for a lot of the men out there. I but, don't mind doggy style. No, listen, we, we are talking about this, and remember, sex is uh, you. It needs to. Uh, it takes two to tango. So you have to basically pleasure both parties, but. You get more engorgement anatomically and based on biomechanics when man is on top and you have a pillow underneath just because you are actually rubbing the entire G-zone, the entire clitoral length and everything and make the clitoris super big. You just sold Brooklyn, Brooklyn in out. I hope that that's one of our did sponsors. You guys do, All the Brooklyn in pillows are sold out. Did you guys do the pile driver test? What's the pile driver <laughs> I don't know, test? I'm just gonna, is the pile driver? Well, that I would assume the angle is even crazier, but l- l- we'll figure out the angles later, Lauren. Hold don't on. worry. So, so uh, people sleep on missionary. They forget about missionary. They think you said it. They think missionary is too vanilla. Missionary is not vanilla. Let's bring it back. Yeah, we I, didn't we? We were just talking about it. We like missionary. Missionary is great if you do it right. And if you do it, and I tell you one more thing: for men, orgasm, ninety-five percent of it is phys- physical for men. Because men don't really think with their brain. Men think with their penis. But for women, really 90% is in the brain. So, you know, they feel the connection with the guy. They feel the mood. They feel this. They feel that. All of those are really important. And imagine the other reason missionary is good. You're face to face. You see your lover. You kiss each other. It's very different. Yep. Huh. Yeah, don't Is missionary going to be the first position that you go for in two weeks with a pillow? Well, now that I know that. Yeah. Now that I know the angle, you know. Okay, so you have to tell us before we end what is on the table because there's this this whole thing happening. You're launching something. Sure. So I'm, you know, I did the, I did the research for my patients in the past two years, uh, three years during COVID. I've been working on a bunch of different things. So one thing that's really important is. Uh, we, I've been working on an orgasm gel for almost five years, and we just published an article on the ingredients that we added one ingredient to every orgasm gel that's out there. And this is like literally the amount that clitoris gets engorged is so much more, and we proved it with ultrasound. So that's one thing. So basically, my sexual line that we came out orgasm gel, uh, you have a vibrator which the good thing about it is is that the angle is very, very adjustable. So it's that mini wand. Usually the mini wands are rigid. But if you look at that one, uh, hold the mini wand. And so when you're turning it on, you can go against the clitoris and it adjusts your clitoris. So it works much better. And I had to ask the manufacturer to make it like this for us. So we had to do like a different mold and all those. That's one thing. The second one that you see, it, it gives you a double stimulation. So uh, G spot or the inside part of the clitoris is in the vagina. So this part goes in the vagina and works like a vibrator in the vagina. And this other part has air pulse motion right on the outside portion of the clitoris, which is the glance of the clitoris. And what about these? I'm going to tell you about that. Also, you can use this on your partner's nipple which a lot of men die for it. And I, I tried it it's between me and you. I love it. <laughs> I, it you, oh my God. You're sending, a, you're sending us a few of these? <laughs> don't underestimate men's nipple, by the way, women who are listening. It's a very sensitive area. And as men age, it gets more sensitive. Huh. Now, depending on what side of your brain men kind of think with and what side is more artistic part, uh, it could be right nipple or left nipple that's more sensitive. But work on it, suck on their nipple, and figure out which one is the best. So I'm going to be sucking on your nipple. Uh, <laughs> new dynamic, but all right, well, let's see what happens. So these three are my favorite. Um, is anybody into shooting here, by the way? Like shooting guns? Shooting guns. Yeah, I go all the time. Perfect. You know ARs? Yeah. Okay. So I call these AR, <laughs> but not... These are called angled rectifiers. I don't know if I've talked about shooting on this show. People, <laughs> no. people must know. I mean, no, no, I live no. in Texas. You don't shoot don't in Texas. Worry. What are you yeah. doing here? You know? <laughs> but these are called, can I have the vagina back? Yes. Please? <laughs> you can have the vagina back. So these are angled rectifiers. So guess what? If you don't have the money to get the vaginoplasty or vaginangelo and you just want to fix the angle, 
what's the hack you can do? Oh, you put it in your butt put and it, it makes your, your vagina be tighter. And it fix no, it fixes the angle because it actually brings just this portion up. Uh, that is the so big- the men out there, if they can, t- they can talk to their women and say, "We got to fix the angle. We got to put this in the butt," and that's <laughs> where and the angle is fixed. And trust me, if they do it once, the woman would want to have for a woman out there. If you have missionary or any kind of sex, put a butt plug up your butt, and it has to be anatomically right. I mean, the butt plugs that we are, we, we don't call them butt plugs, we call them angle rectifier, but it needs to be just thick in the right part. This is the part that's exactly where your perineal body is that fixes the angle of your vagina. So right here. So you want to bring this part up, and guess what? The angle is right, and then you and your partner are going to feel completely different. The vagina is going to feel tighter, but at the same time, he's going to rub against the G-spot. I want to try that. That sounds amazing. You have to try it. And by the way, when you get tired of it, you can try them too. Now, wait, what what is he doing with them? I tell you one thing. A lot of men are, and um, look, um, first of all, a lot of gay men and my friends that try it, they love it, of course, because they are more open with their, you know, butt and something being up there. But even for a straight man, I tell you something about butt plugs. Where is your G spot? Do you know? Well, I know, I know it's up there. I've the perlinium, right? Don't you the, need to milk them? Your G spot is. It, listen, G spot in a woman is up here, three centimeters, two centimeters in. That's where all the nerves are converging. And guess where our nerves are converging? They all in that area of prostate. So if a woman is giving you a blowjob, you know, having oral sex, and she has a finger up your butt and actually massaging that area of the prostate at the same time, you will have an orgasm that you never had in your life. And when I talk about this, I actually have a post on Instagram. A lot of men say, oh, you know, stop promoting that. And especially you can't talk about it in Texas. But you know what? If it's about (laughs) pleasure, if it's good for goose, it's good for gander. So I feel like it's... uh, it makes it put the orgasms on a completely different Hold level. On, Listen, if, this is a balanced show. We can talk about shooting wait, and going up the guy's ass I, in the same sense. If of I course. have a manicure and I don't want to stick my manicure finger up his butt, you can stick one of these butt plugs, not called butt plugs, but you can just stick one up there so this can just take the job of my manicure. 100%. And if he gets more comfortable after, because these two are kind of beginner. This is advanced. I wouldn't put advanced in. I'm not going to put advanced put in. Advanced. I would think I would just put in being interviewed. <laughs> advanced looks a little bit. Um, advanced looks. <laughs> advanced looks like it, whoa. Advanced, it, yeah, we might be to put the like, toe in the water first before we go to the the. Uh, the advanced looks a, a little extreme at this point in time. Shove it up there. But listen, put the beginner in, and I tell you what to do. Put the beginner after he gets used to it. You start with this part on his nipple, and then put this inside his butt, and if you don't want to use your manicure finger, and turn on the vibration. So as this is vibrating against the prostate, he gets a blowjob. Uh, he's not going to leave the house. He would want like 10 more of those. <laughs> I'm trying this. All right, well, I will take one for the team. Let's, let's, let's baby step Listen, I, I do like, I'm pretty good at multitasking. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is, we're gonna, <laughs> I'm going to take it to your nipple. We'll report back to it. I might need those stem cells sooner rather than later. <laughs> I'm going to shove that up your ass. And wait, where do I put the vibrating part on? The, I turn the vibrator on. So when you go in the ass, imagine if this is a... A man. If this is a man, so there's a penis here. Let's say this is the penis. Okay. Okay. So where is the prostate? Prostate is in here. It's up, right? up, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So what you're going to do, you're going to put this top, top part up, and you're going to turn it on, and it's going to vibrate against this prostate. And as you go a little back and forth... And you're going to exactly know where he's going to have the most sensation because he's going to tell you, he's like, just hold it right there. <laughs> now, do they come out of the asshole or out of the penis? Because I've heard that there's what? like, that, my friends, well, shout out to Steve. Let's, my friend well, well, Steve told me about milking. Let's go back to prostate. biology now. Um, I don't think- I'm not crazy. So mil- milking, no, uh, that, that's, that's different. That milking the prostate is basically... Eventually, everything is going to come out of the penis. Got because, it. I just uh, thought maybe it came out of both ways. No. Oh, my God. That, that's probably poop. But. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, let's... <laughs> okay. So where can everyone find Before we find get your... into this milking, Lauren, let's make sure you understand basic anatomy. Here. I do. <laughs> so where can everyone find your sex toys? Because everyone wants to go get this beginner. It's not a butt plug. It's called a what? 
uh, angle rectifier, AR. Angle, angle, rectifier. angle rectifier. Okay. Yes. Okay. So where can everyone find this if they want to shop it? So the website is going to be up and running exactly in two weeks from now. Uh, it's going to be getsaray.com. Um, C E R E G E T in the beginning, G E T C E R E dot com. But uh, they can always go to my Instagram, NYC Gyno, and I will have the link for that. Okay. So do a lot of people text or DM you pictures of their vagina? They do. They do. Okay. So <laughs> go on there, you guys get wild. You can do whatever you want, send weird pictures. <laughs> <laughs> NYC guy, no, I think he's amazing. I think you're so talented. I think you are the modern day. What did you call it? Uh, Michelangelo. You called it something else. Vagilangelo. Vagilangelo. <laughs> amazing. You are so talented at NYC guy, no. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Thank you. This is fun. The vagina whisper. I learned a lot. Thank you. <laughs> you're great.